we now return to Let's Play Zork. All right, open the trap door again, and go down. Our sword is glowing a faint blue. Well, this time we are going to go north. The Troll Room. This is a small room with passages to the east and south, and a forbidding hole leading west. Blood stains and deep scratches, perhaps made by an axe, mar the walls. A nasty-looking troll, brandishing a bloody axe, blocks all passages out of the room. Your sword has begun to glow very brightly. Let's say, um... Attack troll with sword. The troll takes a fatal blow and slumps to the floor dead. Almost as soon as the troll breathes his last breath, a cloud of sinister black fog envelops him, and when the fog lifts, the carcass has disappeared. Your sword is no longer glowing. Go east, then. This is a narrow east-west passageway. There is a narrow stairway leading down at the north end of the room. Let's continue going east. Round room. This is a circular stone room with passages in all directions. Several of them have unfortunately been blocked by cave-ins. Let's see if we can examine the entrances. Examine passages. Okay. That's where the map in the manual comes in handy. We are going to go southeast. An engravings cave. You have entered a low cave with passages leading northwest and east. There are old engravings on the wall here. Examine engravings. The engravings were incised in the living rock of the cave wall by an unknown hand. They depict, in symbolic form, the beliefs of the ancient Zorkers. Skillfully interwoven with the base reliefs are excerpts illustrating the major religious tenets of that time. Unfortunately, a later age seems to have considered them blasphemous and just as skillfully excised them. Let's go east. The Dome Room. You are at the periphery of a large dome, which forms the ceiling of another room below. Protecting you from a precipitous drop is a wooden railing which encircles the dome. Uh, let's save. We will do LP2. And we will look over the railing. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's uh, look at my inventory. I am carrying a sword, a rope, and a brass lantern. Tie rope to a railing. The rope drops over the side and comes within ten feet of the floor. Go down. The torch room. This is a large room with a prominent doorway leading to a down staircase. Above you is a large dome. Up around the edge of the dome, twenty feet up, is the wooden railing. In the center of the room sits a white marble pedestal. A piece of rope descends from the railing above, ending some five feet above your head. Sitting on the pedestal is a flaming torch made of ivory. Well, instead of touching that right now, let's just go south. The temple. This is the north end of a large temple. On the east wall is an ancient inscription, probably a prayer in a long-forgotten language. Below the prayer is a staircase leading down. The west wall is solid granite. The exit to the north end of the room is through huge marble pillars. There is a brass bell here. Uh... Examine inscription. The prayer is inscribed in an ancient script, rarely used today. It seems to be a philippic against small insects, absent-mindedness, and the picking up and dropping of small objects. The final verse consigns trespassers to the land of the dead. All evidence indicates that the beliefs of the ancient Zorkers were obscure. Alright, let's uh, search the room. Search temple. You can't see a temple here. <laughs> okay, well, despite the fact that it does not explicitly say so, along the east wall on the map here, there is also an Egyptian room to the east. So we'll just go east, east. Egyptian room. This is a room which looks like an Egyptian tomb. There is an ascending staircase to the west. The solid gold coffin used for the burial of Ramses II is here. A lean and hungry gentleman just wandered through, carrying a large bag. Finding nothing of value, he left disgruntled. Uh, let me check my inventory. 
Okay. He did not take anything from me. That gentleman may have something to do with uh, who's locking the uh, trap door when we come down here. Um, a solid gold coffin that he did not find valuable. Okay. Well, we are going to examine the coffin. It is closed. Uh, we will take the coffin. Uh, your load is too heavy. We will drop the sword. We will take the coffin. We will go west. We are back in the temple with a brass bell. Look around. This is the north end of the temple on the east wall is an ancient inscription. Below the prayers, a staircase leading down. West wall is solid granite. The exit to the north end of the room is through huge marble pillars. So I guess then the prayer is the staircase leading down. That that was that room then. So what about the other room? Because the map shows there is a southern room. Go south. The altar. This is the south end of a large temple. In front of you is what appears to be an altar. In one corner is a small hole in the floor which leads into darkness. You probably could not get back up it. On the two ends of the altar are burning candles. On the altar is a large black book opened to page 569. Well, we're going to have to come back to this place, so we won't touch anything, and we will just go down the hole. I don't know the word hole. Go down. You haven't a prayer of getting the coffin down there? Well, if anywhere seems like the time, it's probably at the altar of a temple. Pray. Forest. This is a forest with trees in all directions. To the east, there appears to be sunlight. You hear in the distance the chirping of a songbird. All right, it's probably time to save again. And let's go east. Forest path. This is a path winding through a dimly lit forest. The path heads north-south here. One particularly large tree with some low branches stands at the end of the path. Go south. North of the house. You are facing the north side of a white house. There is no door here, and all the windows are boarded up. To the north, a narrow path winds through the trees. Okay, that tree that we passed with the songbirds probably going to be important. We'll come back. Later we will go east. Behind the house. Look around. You're behind the White House. A path leads into the forest to the east. We will go east. A clearing. You are in a small clearing in a well-marked forest path that extends east and west. Go east. Canyon view. You are at the top of the Great Canyon on its west wall. From here, there is a marvelous view of the canyon and part of the frigid river upstream. Uh, across the canyon, the walls of the White Cliffs join the mighty ramparts of the Flathead Mountains to the east. Following the canyon upstream to the north, Aragain Falls may be seen complete with rainbow. The mighty frigid river flows out from a great dark cavern. To the west and south can be seen an immense forest stretching for miles around. A path leads northwest. It is possible to climb down into the canyon from here. We will climb down. What do you want to climb down? The canyon? Go, go down. All right. Rocky Ledge. You are on a ledge about halfway up the wall of the river canyon. You can see from here that the main flow from Aragain Falls twists along a passage which it is impossible for you to enter. Below you is the canyon bottom. Above is more cliff, which appears climbable. We will go down again. Canyon bottom. You are beneath the walls of the river canyon, which may be climbable here. The lesser part of the runoff of Aragain Falls flows by below. To the north is a narrow path. Go north. End of the rainbow. You are on a small rocky beach on the continuation of the frigid river past the falls. The beach is narrow due to the presence of the white cliffs. The river canyon opens here and sunlight shines in from above. A rainbow crosses over the falls to the east and a narrow path continues to the southwest. Let's take a moment at this peaceful location to go over what we found so far. We have a golden coffin shining like the sunlight above, and a brass lantern, which we probably should have turned off because now the batteries are going to be dead. Um, let's examine that coffin again. 
open the coffin. The gold coffin opens. A scepter, possibly that of ancient Egypt itself, is in the coffin. A scepter is ornamented with colored enamel and tapers to a sharp point. Examine the scepter. There's nothing special about it. Well, it's shiny and multicolored like the rainbow, so let's wave the scepter at the rainbow. Suddenly, the rainbow appears to become solid and, I venture, walkable. I think the giveaway was the stairs and banister. A shimmering pot of gold appears at the end of the rainbow. Take pot of gold. It is taken. All right, so now that we've got some valuables, let's save. And let's go back. It said southwest, right? So go southwest. Canyon bottom. Go up. Go up. And according to the map, we go north west. To the clearing. Go west. Behind the house. Enter the window. And we're now back in the kitchen. The lunch is still sitting there, but we will take the garlic, go into the west room, and we will open the case, put gold, gold into case, put coffin into case, put scepter into case. Um, that's kind of important. Inventory. Um, let me restore for a minute. <laughs> Inventory. The golden coffin contains a scepter. I see. So it was still in the coffin. So I took it out, waved it around, Okay, okay, that's that's fine though. Um, so let, now let's see, we gotta uh, go southwest, go up, go up, go northwest, go west, uh, enter window, take garlic, go west. Open coffin, take scepter, open case, put coffin in case, put coffin in case, put scepter in case, put gold in case case now let's look at inventory close the case I know that I had said you know let's not waste moves on stuff like this I'm sure it would not make a difference if we opened or closed the case with that rangy thief about anyway that's more treasures we have put away Quite a few, in fact. And I think we should end the episode with another history lesson of Chapter 2, An Empire Goes Underground. In 665, the forces of Duncan Thrax vanquished the Antharian Armada at the famous Battle of Fort Griffspotter. The island nation of Antharia was, at the time, the world's premier sea power, and this victory gave Duncan Thrax undisputed control of the Great Sea and put the superb shipbuilding facilities of Antharia at his disposal. The conquest of Antharia also gave Duncan Thrax possession of Antharia's famed granola mines. Unfortunately, no one in Quendor, Kendor liked granola. Within months, Kendor, Quendor's navy, was returning from voyages with tales of a magical land on the distant eastern shore of the Great Sea. Duncan Thrax was incensed that this vast land existed outside his dominion and spent many nights storming the halls of his castle bellowing at his servants and advisors. Then, one day, he had a sudden inspiration, assemble a huge fleet, cross the Great Sea, and conquer the lands on the eastern shore. Not only would he extend his empire, but he'd finally have a market for all the useless granola. 
As Duncan Thrax's invasion swept across the new lands, he made a startling discovery. Huge caverns and tunnels, populated by gnomes, trolls, and other magical races, all of whom loved granola. Even as Duncan Thrax conquered this region, his imagination was inspired by this natural underground formation. If these caverns and tunnels were possible in nature, so might they be formed by humans. Duncan Thrax realized that by burrowing into the ground, he could increase the size of his empire fivefold or even tenfold. The Frabaz Magic Construction Company, the forerunner of the modern industrial giant Frabaz Co. International, was formed to undertake this project in 668. For the remaining 20 years of Duncan Thrax's reign, cavern building continued at a breakneck pace. The natural caverns in the eastern lands were expanded tremendously, and new caverns and passages were dug in the western lands, chiefly in the vicinity of Duncan Thrax's castle, Egrith. By the time of his death in 688, Duncan Thrax ruled virtually all territory in the known world, above and below ground. And with that, I will end this one here, and I will see you next time.